million years of time. And when the blue line is high, the sort of overall global temperature is high. And when the blue line is low, overall global temperature is low. And you can see that the cold periods correspond to periods of ice. So there have been different glacial periods back hundreds of millions of years. And uh, those are represented along the bottom as sort of these areas of ice formation on the planet. Then the yellow bars are the five major extinction events that have occurred in the, on the planet starting 500 million years ago and running up towards the present. And so what we want to ask is, do those major extinction events where huge portions of, of the Earth's biota were wiped out, do those correspond to changes in climate? And starting from the left, the answer is yes initially, because this very first extinction event, the Ordovician Silurian extinction event, corresponded to a big abrupt cooling event globally. And that cooling event happened because all the land masses of the Earth, we know that the land of the Earth slowly shifts around in the oceans. Well, 450 million years ago, um, much of the land masses of the Earth lined up at the poles and resulted in rapid glaciation, uh, which had huge impacts both on land but also in the oceans. And many species genera and taxa were lost in that extinction event. So that one's clearly linked to climate. But the other ones, as you can see yourself, aren't so clearly linked to climate. So this is a big abrupt climate change, right? So we see that here in the blue line. Big abrupt climate change linked to an extinction event. All the rest of the extinction events are maybe associated with some changes in climate. Here's one that starts as a, a long cooling trend begins. Here's one that occurs as a long warming trend is ending. Here's one that's occurring, here are two that are occurring when global mean temperature is relatively stable. And we know that this, this is the last extinction event that wiped out the dinosaurs, and we know that was caused by an extraterrestrial impact. So we know this one wasn't directly caused by climate change. And the explanations for these other three are largely non-climatic, either volcanic eruptions or extraterrestrial mm -hmm. impacts. And it's not clear what caused most of them, but there are several candidates, and most of those candidate explanations involve extraterrestrial impacts and volcanism. Some other explanations have been put forward. But the one thing that these other extinction events have in common is almost all of them have some sort, all of those explanations of those other extinction events have major climatic uh, actions that impact the extinction event. So for instance, when the extraterrestrial impact, when the meteor hit the Yucatan, there were projectile uh, spherules put up into the atmosphere that caused very rapid warming, and then there was a lot of ash from burning and from the impact that resulted in cooling across the planet for thousands or millions of years. And so while the proximal cause of that extinction was the impact in the Yucatan, uh, the climatic ramifications of that impact are, may well be what caused the extinction. So there are climatic links even when the, the causes of these major extinction events are not directly caused by climate. Uh, volcanism is another example. Some of these extinction events are believed to have been caused by massive outpourings of lava in, in Russia and the Siberian traps. And those sorts of events would also have major climatic changes associated with them. So climate is somewhere in the mix here in these five major past extinction events from pretty clearly implicated in the oldest one to implicated to be a likely ancillary cause in most of the, the other ones. Okay. Yes, Emily. On the end of the slide, on the, uh, the right-hand side of the last slide, uh, we're getting closer to the present. So what, uh, ah, so what is happening? 
So it, here, on these time scales, global temperature is cooling, okay? Because this, this is showing mi hundreds of millions of years, we don't see the present. The present is some little dot here that's completely invisible on this, this chart. So I think your question is, well, if, if we're worried about global warming, why is this chart showing cooling? Well, this chart is co showing cooling because over the last 50 million years, <coughs> the Earth has been cooling. In fact, if you remember, um, we cool, and we'll talk about this, we'll go to talk about this in a minute, but you know, we, the Earth entered the ice ages about two million years ago, and, but before that, it was progressively cooling. Ice was forming in Antarctica and in the North Pole, and so the Earth was gradually cooling over about 50 million years, and then we hit the ice ages, which was a period of going in and out of cool and relatively warm periods, and now human causes are driving this the other way um, to uh, result in rapid warming, which isn't shown on this chart at all because this is sort of uh, the deep time chart of, of climate change. But we'll sp the subsequent slides will get to more recent climate change. Um, we can look at this really quickly. This is the same time scale, sort of 500 million years ago to present, uh, but the vertical scale is, in this case, the number of species in, on the planet. Um, in this case, it's mostly marine species because we know about deep time mostly from the marine fossil record. Um, those same five extinction events, which I indicated as yellow bars, just sort of schematically indicating them as periods of time, are shown here in more detail. You can see here's a big drop in species, there, well, this is genera, a big drop in biodiversity here, that's an extinction event. Here's another big drop in biodiversity. So these little hash marks mark the five major extinction events. So this is just to show how those five major extinction events were calculated. We look at the fossil record of how many genera there were, were in the planet and when there are huge drops, those are the five major extinction events. Well, we know more about those extinction events than just these uh, drops in this uh, plot of genera, but that's what's going on. An interesting thing that's also happening is you notice overall biodiversity is increasing over the last 500 million years. So, um, for whatever it's worth, as we have, we've had increasing biodiversity over 500 million years, but it's been punctuated by these extinction events where huge proportions of biodiversity disappears. Um, Question. Yeah. Question? I think in the graph, the number of species increase, does increase? Genera. Genera, yeah. What is the, what will be the baseline? I don't understand. What is the? The baseline of the genera. Oh, baseline. Well, this is just simply a count. So this is just number of genera. This is just thousands of genera here. And so they just go through the fossil record and they ask how many uh, genuses of species are there and, and mark them down. So this is just a measure. So if, if you're wondering you know, what those fossil species they're looking at look like, well, they look something like this. So here's... Uh, and remember, we don't have a lot of terrestrial fossils to draw on in deep time, so this is mostly uh, information from marine sediments where we have little shells or something in the sediment that we can identify down to level of genera, and, um, and that's how they do their count. So they'll literally be looking at marine sediments and looking at fossils in it to determine what the, the biodiversity was at the time. Uh, but here's a look at what the fossil record suggests it looks like across one of these extinction events. So before the extinction event, you have nautilus, you have um, fan corals, you have bony fishes, you have a rich sort of benthic community and subbenthic. And then after the extinction event, you have a very poor uh, fauna, just a few bivalves around. So these extinction events are really dramatic things where you have huge 
losses of all sorts of species in the oceans. And we assume that probably something similarly dramatic took place on land as well, but we, we don't know that for sure because we don't have the fossil record on land. Okay, so, you know. One other thing to say about these extinction events is in the oceans, if you happen to be interested in the oceans, they've also been times when there are no known cor episodes of coral reef formation. So once a coral reef forms, uh, it can exist for millions of years and people can date it and determine when it was formed. And, um, and through that, we have a record of when coral reefs were formed throughout the world through time. And in those same uh, five major extinction events, no major coral reefs were formed anywhere in the world. So these are called reef gaps because there's no record of reefs being formed anywhere in the world in these times. Uh, they also are times of change in the organisms that form, uh, I almost said coral reefs, the changes in or organisms that form calcareous reefs. So modern corals form reefs now, but in the past, types of clams and sponges that were calcareous formed reefs, and uh, those organisms that form uh, calcium carbonate reefs tend to change on one side of an extinction event to another, which is another good indication that all sorts of things were wiped out and new species were, were coming up to do things. So here on land, we don't have to worry so much about uh, reef gaps, but we do need to think about what's been happening with climate over the last 30 or 50 million years, just to begin to get perspective on what Emily was asking about, about what's going on in this declining area. So you remember in our first slide, we had that the cooling in the planet going on over about 50 million years. Well, this is just a blown up version of that. So this timeline is from the present back to about 60 million years. And again, plotted on the vertical axis is temperature. And this is from di different sort of ways of estimating global temperature. But you see this distinct cooling trend over that 50 million year period. And when we get down here near the present, you see all this variation. Well, that's the ice ages. So that's warming and cooling taking place as uh, the planets cool. So just a couple of major landmarks to think about as we come from 500 million years down to 50 million years of climate change. The ice sheets in Antarctica started to form about 40 million years ago. So here, 34 million years ago, we we're starting to get formation of ice sheets in Antarctica. The fact that they're that's not a solid line, indicates that the ice sheets formed and then disappeared for a while. And then there's a big period from about 30 million years ago to 25 million years ago where you had continuous ice in Antarctica. And then there's a period where it came and went for a while. And then from 10 million years on, we've had ice in Antarctica nonstop. So we think of ice in Antarctica as a very permanent thing. On our time scales it is, but on geological time scales, it's been in the past 40 million years that there's been ice in Antarctica. Ice in the northern hemisphere on the North Pole is an even more recent event, and it seems like about the time that ice really set up permanently in Antarctica, then ice in North America began to appear, and we have ice sheets occurring from 10 million years ago till present and in various extents. So this solid line indicates that there's sort of continuous ice at the North Pole, but we know we're going in and out of ice ages where that ice may come down far down south below the pole and then retreat back up in, in interglacials. Um, so again, as we get close to the present, the last couple million years, we're going in and out of ice ages, which is causing all this variation around the red average line, um, which isn't to say there wasn't a lot of variation sometimes in these past events, but we don't have very good data in the past. Uh, the one other landmark here is the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum, which is this big spike in temperature that occurred 54 million years ago. So it's labeled here uh, the late Paleocene thermal maximum, but it's now called the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum. 
It happens right at the boundary between the Paleocene and the Eocene, and it's a huge jump in temperature, a four or five degrees change in global mean temperature. That's about what we're going to put the world through, through climate change in the future. And so for past insights into what future climate change might mean, this event is important. And these events, these go entering and leaving ice ages are important because they're big temperature swings as well. So we're just doing this quickly. Uh, and then if we want to look on land, an important thing to remember is that we now call <coughs> rainforests tropical forests. But warm, wet forests have existed much farther north than they do now in the past. And so let's look over about the, the last 100 million years of modern plant life and ask where warm, wet forests existed at the time. So these are sometimes called megathermal forests. Um, we can call them tropical forests, but obviously we're looking at them when they exist way outside of the tropics. So we have to be a little cautious about that. So let's just look at where warm, wet forests similar to the forests that exist in the tropics today once existed. Now, that timeline that we just looked at from sort of 60 million years ago on is down here with little arrows to indicate where we are in that timeline. So about 100, 90, 100 million years ago, just as modern plant forms were emerging, this is the distribution of warm rainforests almost everywhere on the planet uh, with some temperate and cooler forests up towards the North Pole. Then if we jump to the next spot, like about 30 or 40 million years later, right here, so we've jumped a huge amount from 90 million years ago to 55 million years ago, the extent of warm wet forests is, is contracting. You see there's some dry forests entering some areas that were previously warm and wet but we still have extensive warm wet forests at latitudes where you'd never find those types of forests today. We jump again towards that cooling. Remember around 35 million years ago there was a cooling as, as ice set up on Antarctica. As we get to that cooling period, then these major warm wet forests in the high latitudes disappear and we begin to see distributions of warm wet forests much more similar to, uh, to where they are today. But if we go back just a sec, this is important to us in California because we have fossil records of warm wet forests. So we know that some of these forests were existing in places where we don't have warm wet forests now. And if we go even further, uh, as we progress towards the present, we find distributions of forests that are similar and as we get to the present, we have roughly the distribution of tropical wet and dry forests that we have today. So the underlying message here is simply that we need to remember that there have been huge changes in distributions of forests of uh, many kinds. Uh, these warm wet forests are sort of easy to track through the fossil record, but many other ecosystems were going through change as well. So over long, long time frames, there have been massive changes in biodiversity and ecosystems across the planet due to climate. Um, and it's late, so we're going to skip through the PETM. Um, and let's go look at something that has an interesting picture, at least, <laughs> which is, um, we briefly say, you know, when I pointed out that big spike of warming temperatures, the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum, uh, this is just a record of what happens to some taxa across that boundary. So that red line marks that big temperature jump where global temperature went up four or five degrees centigrade. And the interesting thing is that a lot of modern taxa appeared for the first time after that event. So primates in particular weren't very prominent uh, in the world until after that pe period of rapid global warming. So we can, <laughs> we can thank the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum for making primates and many of the, the species that we uh, are associated with much more common after that. And probably for the same reasons that species assemblages changed after the major extinction events. It was a big biological driver and it changed, it wiped out a number of species, wiped out these species which end at that 
sp that spike in temperature and opened up possibilities for other species to, to fill in those gaps. <laughs> and then just to show something that's a little more visual, <laughs> if we want to look at what happened as the ice sheets set up on Antarctica, here's a rapid cooling event. So we looked at a rapid warming event. Now let's look at a rapid cooling event. Well, what happened in Antarctica during that rapid cooling event was that the continent shifted in ways that there were no land masses uh, um, near Antarctica, and so the circum-Antarctic current was established, which is a big current that runs all the way around Antarctica, and it basically insulates Antarctica from the temperatures in the rest of the world, keeping it very cold and keeping the marine environment very cold, and at the time that that cold water current set up, it caused the disappearance of bony fish and crabs from Antarctica. So you have these benthic communities in Antarctic, Antarctica that are dominated by these feather stars, crinoids and uh, ophiuroids, brittle stars, in ways that are completely different from what happened in the rest of the planet. Um, as the planet warms, crabs and bony fish are re-entering Antarctica and there's the possibility of wholesale changes in the marine environment and the marine biota in Antarctica. And if that doesn't bother you, then you sh I should show you pictures of feather stars and brittle stars and show you how cool they are. So that's a rapid sort of run through of what's happened in deep climate time. And uh, next time we'll take a look at what happened in the ice ages, uh, which is another period with it which in which rapid warming occurred periodically and we can ask what that tells us about what may happen as human <laughs> climate change unfolds and we go through another rapid warming period. Um, so I think that brings us to the end for today. Any uh, questions? Thank you.